Hello, Sam here, editor of Oracle Time, and welcome to the first of what will be a series of videos diving deep into British watchmaking. Now, first off, we thought we would talk to what is quickly becoming one of the more successful British watch brands of the last few years, um, Nicholas Bowman Scargill, re-founder of Fears Watches. Um, so, the big question, you had a great job as an apprentice watchmaker at Rolex, great company, great position within the company, and then you left to forge your own path and your own brand. Why? So I'm I'm a Rolex, absolutely loving the job, really enjoying it. Mm -hmm. And then one Sunday, I'm back home with my parents, having a Sunday roast. And I said to them, you know, I'm enjoying my job, but one day I might like to do run my own business. But I naively was saying, I don't know what it would be in. I don't know what industry, I'm not sure what I would do. And my mum, as she's serving the roast potatoes, jokingly goes, well, why don't you restart the family watch company? <laughs> And you know when you just kind of light bulb <laughs> moment, an absolute light bulb moment, Eureka going, but what family watch company? And so she, she went off and came back with an old photo album. She had an old advert from 1946, which was the centenary of, of Fears, when, uh, first hundred years since it had been founded. And said, oh, this, this is what, you know, this was, you know, set up by your relatives. Um, and I tell you what, from that train journey back to London that evening, it was sort of one of those, you know, literally a little little speck that just snowballed out of control. When you've literally been handed a family legacy to, to carry the torch forward from. So obviously uh, Fears relaunched uh, in earnest in 2016. Yes. What was the British watch industry like at that point? Back in 2016, I, you know, as I was researching, as I was learning how I was going to start the company, I was calling up watch companies the owners of British brands saying, I would like to sit down and chat to you. I'd like to pick your brains. And a lot of people were very suspicious. And they, you know, <laughs> there just wasn't a willingness to communicate and talk about it. Fast forward to today, we now have an official trade body, the Alliance of British Watch and Clockmakers. Of course, yeah. Of which I'm delighted to be one of the founding board members. And this has now suddenly linked these brands and suddenly starting conversations. Today, it's not uncommon for watch brand owners to go out for lunch and you know share their problems or help each other out with supplier issues. When I was doing that or trying to do that back in 2016, no one spoke to anyone. I was very lucky a few people did, and that today they're they're some of my closest and friends. Why in the do you think there has been that shift in the past five years though? I think it's I think the reason there has been this shift is today people have a better understanding about British watch industry and British watches as a concept and realised that, you know, Fears has a, a part in that industry. And actually, if the whole industry grows, that benefits me, rather than me single-handedly trying to say to you, rather than buying a Swiss watch, you should buy a Fears watch. Whereas if I, along with 60 other brands are going, rather than buying the Swiss watch, you should buy a British watch for the following reasons. It's a stronger argument. Obviously, you've mainly been talking about the British watch industry over the past sort of 10, 15 years, but it goes back way, way further than that. If you go to Greenwich Observatory and see the Harrisons, the, the sort of original marine chronometers that help us dominate the waves yes. back, way back when in the glory days of the British Empire. <laughs> um, so it is surprising that Britain has this kind of level of watchmaking heritage. How much do you think that that has informed the current crop of British watch brands and how much are they kind of not an antithesis to it but going against the grain in that respect? Well heritage Heritage is a great thing, and it's also a very dangerous thing. It is a beautifully made sword. It's very sharp on both sides. 
And this is something I've had to deal with, you know, personally with, with fears, you know, setting up a, a modern company which has this incredible history, you know, an archive of designs, of watches, you know, we've got all of this story to talk about. But, and this is the reason I say it's a bad thing, it's very easy to just go, well, we'll just recreate that. And, you know, some people may care, but actually, I have always for myself, and what I'm pleased to see in our industry is a lot of brands have also wanted to do this for themselves, is to go, no, I want to be relevant today on my own two feet because of what I make as a contemporary mm. British watch company that happens to have this extensive heritage rather than just relying on it. You go back through the, the heritage, the Harrison, you mentioned Harrison. You know, we're talking about huge innovation so even though we look at it and it's like, wow, look at this great thing in the past. Well, really, we want to be creating the new stories today that people in 300 years will look back and go, wow, look at what they did yeah. in well, the 2020s. Well, I guess there's, there's no point referencing the heritage of a brand no one knows about or sort of giving a name that no one's heard, that kind of faux heritage that just yes. it comes across as a little bit desperate to try and manufacture heritage as opposed to being inspired by it. One of the easiest things I could have done when I restarted Fears was just having on the dial Fears 1846 below it because that's when the company was started and then we could have just picked any watch from the archive and said we're going to remake that. But instead I said let's play a game. What would Fears be making today in, in 2016 if it hadn't closed down. So let's look through the archive and be inspired by certain trends, certain design elements that Fears always did, and then create a modern watch based on those. Now, five years later, with the establishment of Fears, I'm pleased that we're actually about to look, launch our first watch within a new archival family. And this is doing the complete opposite Everything before now has had that <laughs> contemporary elegance edge. This is literally looking back and picking a specific model from the archive. So by your own admission, this was the easiest watch you've released to date? The easiest watch, but also to do it properly has been the most <laughs> complex watch because it, you could just make something that looks like it. But the way we've decided to do it is we're saying all watches in the archival family will be proportional recreations using new old stock mm. movements. Okay, that's a huge part, um, the, the new old stock movements, but I will stop you there because we have the actual watches here. We do, yes. <laughs> so, do you want to hold them up to the camera? Well, so I'm referencing the, the original piece from the archive. This is it. So this is a watch we made in 1930. This <laughs> is a very elegant dress watch. By modern standards, absolutely tiny. I mean, you put yeah, it you put it I, on the wrist and it looks absolutely dainty. Please do. Like all the watches we have in our archive, it's fully serviced and fully functioning. But what's lovely with this is to look back and go, wow, this is the modern watch Fears made in 1930. I want to recreate that and I want to do it properly and as authentically that is as possible. Very delicate. And that gold border around the outside is magnificent. It's got a, still, after all this time, has a proper mirror shine, whereas the rest of the dial is lovely and patinaed and very beautifully aged. I think it's very distinctive. You know, I, I hold that watch up to other rectangular watches and it feels very different. The proportions, the very tall, the fact that you've got the numbers down the side running in two straight mm. lines. I've not seen that before. It's very OCD symmetrical. It is, Lovely. yes. Yes, if you want your rectangular watch to be perfectly symmetrical, <laughs> we, we're, we've got it here. And so what we've done is we've recreated it. What, in terms of size, we've grown the watch by 17.7%. The reason being is this uses a new old stock movement from 1935. And the movements we have are a little bit larger than the movement in the original. So we had to grow the case accordingly. Uh, so there are two different versions of the watch, yes? That's correct. So we've got the archival 1930 small seconds, mm -hmm. and then we've also got the archival 1930, which is a two-hander using a new old stock movement from the 60s. The reason we've got two versions is, I mentioned we've, we were limited by how many of the 
original 1930s movements we could get. Yeah. But also, making 175 watches for the 175th anniversary, I was very keen that these watches represented the anniversary properly. So we have built 136 watches with two hands and 39 with three hands. And that represents the 136 years that Fears has been operational and the 39 years when it was closed and dormant. And it's just a very subtle nod. Rather than glossing over this part of our history, I'm saying, no, this is a part of our history and a lot of British business history. Let's actually acknowledge it. And so each watch, rather than carrying a limited edition number, is engraved with a unique year from 1846 to 2021. And the watches from 1977 to 2015 are the dormant years on the freehander. So 175 pieces, best get in quick, I'm assuming. Well, certainly if, it, nicely. certainly if there's a, a birth year <laughs> you're after or an anniversary you want to mark. Um, we, we are taking requests from people. If someone says they want a particular year, if it's available, we will happily That's send them fair. that year. Great. So I think uh, just to just to end our conversation, let's circle back to the British watch industry. Um, in your sage opinion, as a integral cog in the wider machine of the British watch industry, <laughs> what do you think the next 10 years will mean for British watchmaking? I think looking back five years, the next 10 years could be very, very positive. I think though it will require a lot of focus, hard work and dedication by the existing brands and the new generation of brands coming through to make sure that we know what we're focusing on and that we can focus and pull together in the same direction rather than a scattergun approach. I don't think the British watch industry will ever rival Switzerland. But I certainly could see us rivaling places like Germany. Mm. I think if we don't try and go mass, if we appreciate and acknowledge what we do best as a country, which is niche, it is more focused, then I think you know we, we can be a very strong player globally with British watches. <laughs>